as I walk through the door, the same type of applause that we had yesterday. So if we could start with that, kidding. Let's, uh, let's do this. Anyone here today that wasn't here yesterday? Okay, a few, quite a few. All right, great. So for the rest of the group, we, uh, we get to play a little catch up, get, get you know, everyone kind of up to speed a little bit. Uh, and then if we have questions um, after this to kind of catch up on some of the stuff that we went through yesterday, it was a bit of a foundation, uh, a bit of understanding of what uh, the generations look like and uh, how, um, and how each has kind of shaped um, you know, what, what we believe, what our values are, how we interact, our communication styles, and that sort of thing as well. I'm just going to pray for us here this morning, and then let's, let's overview real quick yesterday, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So let's pray. Uh, God, this is your morning, and this is your space, and we're your people. So take all of that and use it for what you want. This is your time as well. And so pray that you'd be honored by it. You look down and just say, this is a blessed time and space and people. Would you, uh, would you open our minds to understand just a little bit more about uh, who we are, who you've created us to be, and then who the people around us are as well, and how we can uh, honor each other, how we can get better at communicating with each other, better about leading each other, and doing life together in this unprecedented time that you've set us in. So we look to you uh, in it. Can't wait for this next hour that we spend together. We love you. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So a uh, quick recap. Yesterday I said... This statement, which when I first said it, there were some blank stares and a few more nods as we got a little further on. But here it is. No matter your age or position in work or life, your personality, your spiritual gifts or whatever else you want to put on that list. This is my list. Whatever else you want to put on this list. Here's what I believe is that not only are we all leaders, but that leadership is in each of our calling. Man, that just gets me so excited to think about doing that. And I believe this because of the words in Scripture all throughout the narrative, to be honest. But we just pick and chose a few of those. So here was a little bit of the list that we went through from Genesis through a couple of chapters of Ephesians. And then at the very beginning uh, of, uh, of Matthew or Jesus' uh, ministry here, we look at from Matthew 28 and Matthew 22. So I said this, God created you and he created me in his image, declared over us that we are very, yeah, this is an interactive thing, by the way, same as yesterday when we call on you. So God said that we are very, Good. yeah, he declared that we have hope and that we have a calling. We spent a little bit of time yesterday looking at hope and then looking at calling. And that as we live our lives that are worthy of that calling, that's from Ephesians 4.1, that he's given to us that we are his masterpiece. His absolute masterpiece. And that's been kind of a theme that's, uh, that's been through some of the sessions here through conference so far. And now we get to be difference makers in the world through the Great Commission and the Great Commandment by leading the world around us, the teams that we lead and our families and our communities and our churches and ourselves in love. That's a whole lot to unpack. That's a whole, I mean, we just spend the rest of the time right in there. But it's because of that that I say, no matter your age or position in life or your personality, spiritual gifts, whatever else you want to choose to put on that list, I believe that we are all leaders. I see you all as leaders. And I believe that leadership is in each of our calling. All right. Then I put up this graphic and we spent a fair amount of time just kind of unpacking this graphic and whether we agree with some of the things uh, whether it applies to us or whether it doesn't and a couple people in the room that kind of you know blow some things that are on here out of the water right and some that definitely make this you know kind of confirm and true i had a few of you guys email me uh, yesterday and even yet this morning asking for this graphic so I just figured I'll just print it out on a page. So you got a handout. Uh, if you didn't get a handout and you want it, um, we have them at the door here. And there's a handout with that graphic. I'm still happy to email you guys uh, that as well. So it's, um, you know, that's there for you. Anybody email me that didn't get that? 
think I responded to all of those, which is great. Um, but if you want it or any resource, uh, if you have questions about anything, please, please reach out and, uh, and email me and we'll, uh, we'll get in touch or find me around conference. Uh, I'm here for most of the sessions this whole week. So yeah. Can you explain the circles on the right side? Yeah, the right side is just the percentage of each generation that's in the workforce or that's the lower uh, circle is um, the percentage that's unemployed from that, uh, from that generation. So this is really important when I'm working with like small businesses and things like that, um, that we really kind of use that data. Again, this isn't a graphic that I put together. This is just a resource that I use, uh, but it's pretty interesting to see that uh, only 5% of the workforce is from the maturist or the traditionalist generation. And that actually uh, the largest generation that's represented in the workplace today. So as you go out to the store or as you're leading organizations, uh, um, that the largest percentage is the Gen Y and Gen Z together. Yeah. Uh, I, this is a couple of years old now. So maybe I've been using this same one for two or three years now. So it's, it's probably a few years old. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. COVID has changed a whole lot of things and uh, yeah, this would be skewed a little bit. Yeah. Could be retired. Yeah. What about Gen, Gen Y? And Z? That doesn't add up to 100 percent too. So they, they might be younger. Okay. So we're not saying 50 percent of Gen Y and Z is unemployed. We're saying in the workforce, 34 percent. Yep. Yep. Okay. This is in your little handout here. So refer to it. It's uh, it's pretty fun to um, to go through. Yeah. You have a sense of how big each generation is in terms of the overall population. Like boomers is a massive group, right? Yeah. Um, you know how they kind of rank? It's a massive group, but it's smaller than the millennials, if I understand it right. But I don't know, have the actual uh, numbers. I can pull that up. Do you, anybody know those numbers? Approximately? It's okay. Have... I've had that question before. I should probably know it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, and I don't have it right here, but um, we may get to it later in the week. Uh, if we look at um, the workforce and what, uh, what this looks like uh, from percentages, and then we look at our churches, and we see what percentage of each generation is going to church. Mm. It can be heartbreaking, sobering at times, for sure. One of the reasons why it's important for us to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, taking a look at it in more detail, I'm the treasurer of our church, mm -hmm. and what percentage actually give, right? Un unpack that for us. Well, the baby boomers, right? They're really good givers. You know, they're, I mean, they grew up giving. They know what it means to give. But some of the, the younger generations, they say, well, if I like it, I'll give, right? But, but scripturally or spiritually, right, it seems they, that they lack that desire. Now maybe it's because they don't make as much. I don't know. But I can sure tell when I you know, look through our givings that baby boomers. The NCA twenty rule, right? Yeah. Twenty yep. percent, you know, see the eighty, they all seem to be boomers. Yeah. Interesting. Anyone else have experience? Oh, I'm sure. You know, part of the, part of that when I look at my kids now when they're in their thirties and forties, they're busy and they've got all these responsibilities and little kids and all the financial responsibility. And I think as you get older that they have to change. It takes a spiritual aspect in your life to make that happen. But I think it, I think they'll probably surprise us. Later on. Later on. Yeah. I, really I know I had an interesting discussion with my two millennial kids when they were passing the buckets, right, back here. And I'd, I'd say, I'd watch every night, how can you guys let these buckets go past and you don't do nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. my generation, we, we didn't do that. Right? Yeah. Something was better than nothing. <clears throat> so it was an interesting conversation. We'll probably have an automatic credit card deduction going through. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's well played. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> 
is interesting, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get a little bit into this, uh, hopefully tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, we'll see where we get to today um, as well. But uh, we, we talked yesterday, some of the questions that were thrown out there, um, and I can go to this, my scribbling, um, you know, team building and, and how do we build these teams, especially if they're multi-generational, all that. We're going to get to some of that here uh, today, but the strategic planning for a church growing young, like that's a, we want to grow young and then why the local church when there's excellence that's found online anytime on demand all of that and uh, part of what we uh, what we're going to go through is a look at this scene and how it affects whether people are involved in church or whether they're not and it may be that uh, that our younger generations they're <laughs> fairly involved in church just maybe not the local church maybe not your church or maybe not as frequent as what it had been in the past it could be that there's just a lack of ownership from the younger generation in the local church. Because again, if you look at, you know, at this and some of the discussion that we had yesterday, you know, our younger generations, Gen Y and Gen Z, they want to be with you, not for you. They don't want to work for you. They want to work with you or alongside you. And the same thing is true for the church. You know, they, they don't want to say, you know, this is, this is the church that I go to. They say this is the, was our church or organization. And there's a lot of organizations vying for their time and their focus, their passions, their finances, all of that. So, you know, for instance, our, our family, there's two different nonprofits outside the church that we are involved in. That's financially that we're involved in with our time and our gifts. One of them I sit on the, the board with, right? I mean, these are, these are things that uh, spread finances a little, a little thinner. Whereas there's a bit more of a focus, especially if you look at the baby boomers and the maturists of what they're going to uh, create ownership in. You know, we, we looked at um, this jobs are for life and the very you know, baby boomers are very organizational, right? They're, they're, the organization is a big part of, uh, of who they are, of what they value. And if that's true, then they're going to uh, take the monies that they have available for giving, and they're gonna support those organizations. And maybe that's just the local church. And maybe that same pool of money from a younger generation is available, but it's divvied three ways. What do you guys think of that? I think it ties to that purpose too, that our um, millennials and uh, Y and Z, I guess. That they they want they they so desire to have their life have purpose and meaning, which is awesome. Like we all should, we're created for that. And like you said, finding purpose and meaning in maybe a para church organization where they are impacting something that they're super passionate about. Whereas maybe we have grown up. Well, the right what you do as a good person is that you go to church mm -hmm. and you go on Sunday and you tie and that's what. It Great. There's one back here. I think that the tax laws also discourage people from giving to nonprofits because they get a big write off without contributing anything. The 26000 or what everybody gets. And I think that's going to hurt all the nonprofits. Fully agree. Yeah. As someone who works with nonprofits, fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> huge. Yep. Um, there was working towards working off your debt and owning your home, and now I, I just see people in our generation buying a lot more than they could afford, and then college debt is a lot different too, so how much money is left over to be able to give? Mm -hmm. 
I concur with that. I, my son and his wife, I helped my son through cows, but he still had some debt, but his wife had a whole bunch of debt. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so they started their marriage with 80,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in a small town, that's way more than they have, than they owe to the house. And, and so their, their college, it's almost paid for now, but the college payment is greater than their house payment. Yeah. And, um, <coughs> but, but in terms of uh, baby boomers and giving to the maturist and giving, um, the whole parachurch industry, if you will, mm -hmm. started under maturists and, and maturity through baby boomers. And, and was funded by maturists and baby boomers at the same time that they were funding the church. So, so I'm not sure that the argument that the money's going more directions today is actually very really accurate. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and I'm, not, and I'm not, not making any comment on the younger generation in that regard. I think we need to hear from them. I don't think we get it. Apart from obvious things like college debt. Sure. I've also noticed that the younger generation doesn't seem to want to be a church member. They want to be a regular or an attender, but they don't want to go to like meetings at church. They don't want to um, they don't feel they should have to put their name on the line for something. Where the older generation, it was like, you felt like you, and I think that maybe is where you feel more obligated to tithe because you're a member. Mm -hmm. Where if you're not a member, you're not really obligated, I guess. I mean, you think that the thought. ownership on that is on the church's part or on the culture's part? What do you think? Yeah, I, th I feel like our culture doesn't want to be nailed down to anything, you know. They don't want that responsibility or whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't pretend to have the answer on this one. I know that I've been part of three churches that membership was just not a priority. Mm -hmm. right. Just simply wasn't a priority. It was something that we offered. It's almost like a ministry that we offered. Yeah. We wanted people to eventually become members. But I mean, it wasn't anything that we talked about that we let our staff in that we uh, encouraged from the platform or social media or anything i mean it was just was, that, was there a particular reason they didn't do that uh, i think one of the main reasons is uh, is the guest experience to be honest um we, you know we want people to be able to come and feel at home and take it at their own pace and get involved as they um you know, at, at the pace that they wanted and were comfortable with maybe get stretched a little bit um, yeah. I, I'll jump in on that though. I, I take responsibility for some of that. Yeah. With my adult kids, you know, watching them and, and raised in the same home, but have different reactions to different. So it is individual per yeah. person and their temperament and whatever. But um, some of us, me, myself, and I'm, you know, whatever, were raised in homes where you went to church because it was the thing to do. I heard, I heard you say, use the word, a good person. And we all know that's not what a relationship with Christ is mm -hmm. about. You can be a good person in lots of ways. But our kids, and my brother, who's older than I am, would look me in the eye and say, I see, I see, I see you, I see others going to church, mm -hmm. and then I see them outside of church, and maybe they're a member or whatever. You know, so I'm saying, uh, we haven't represented ourselves real well in some cases. I'm not oh. blanketing all of them. We haven't been a good example, and we put, we've made it legalistic. You know, you go, you be a good kid, you show up, you go to youth group, yeah. and that didn't mean anything. Yeah. Well, can we all agree it's a complicated equation? Yes. Right? There's no one silver bullet or one answer, or, yeah, we all get to bring all of this stickiness and mess into this equation in the scene and everything, yeah. Well, I think it's more complicated today than it has been for the last thousand years just because of these and the computer age. And there's five-year-olds that pick up phones and can do things on it that we, you know, some of us older people can't do. And they're being so affected by what they see from YouTube and Instagram and all this stuff. You know, my, my kids will say, well, I just heard a sermon on the phone. They don't feel they need to fellow. I don't know. They don't, they don't seem to crave that fellowship of the church. And then this thing with COVID coming around the last five months, four months, whatever, that even brings them away even more from the church. And they watch so many things on TV or the computer. Mm -hmm. We're not living in the same, it's so different. It's 
different. And, frust- and it's frustrating. Be- I mean, I love the big mega churches like Saddleback and the ones in Texas and all these others, and they do televise them. But this, it seems like to me, we were just talking, the small, intimate home church doesn't work at all for the generation from maybe 40 down. They just, they're all, all these churches are sitting empty everywhere. We spent like, we spent a million dollars or half a million in all these different churches and they're so empty. Mm-hmm. It's sad. I'll talk about that in a couple of days. In a couple of days of why the local church and what, what's the role of the local church in this five generational world and how do we program for it? How do we grow young? Should we even grow young? The positive part of the, the younger generation is it's not so exclusive. You have to be a member of one of the churches in a small town to kind of as a prideful thing. I'm a member of this. I'm a member of that. Mm. Whereas the church universal, the younger generation, has an opportunity to... Um, be, be more inclusive and hmm. yeah well let's let's agree to this i hope is that if there's a choice of being able to grow spiritually at whatever pace it is through a device or not grow at all i'm going to choose our culture grow in through a device any 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 day of the week but if there's a choice of only growing on a device or maybe a blend of that and in person, well, that is a way better scenario in my mind for all the reasons that we talked through yesterday. Yeah. Okay, let's keep rolling here. This is awesome. We're going to continue in discussion with this and uh, see where we go uh, with, to, you know, with today. This is um, a bit of the last of the recap from yesterday, the current scene, which we've been talking about indirectly already this morning the speed at which we're going the convenience the things are just right at our fingertips all the time entertainment and we live in this just entertainment culture the highest stimuli environments that have ever been Uh, nurture the nurturing environments that we have now and then the sense of entitlement and that is just the scene that paints the picture of how we get to figure out this equation how we get to program how we get to love love on our family that's the scene in our family by the way that's the scene in our workplaces and that's certainly the scene in our churches as well and so um, for better or worse that's what we've got Uh, again i love the conversation so that's going to be a bit of how we do today as well is, uh, is we'll just bounce uh, bounce around with things and we'll see where where we get and if we need to roll some of this into tomorrow that's not an all bad thing um, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate that there, there's uh, a term we use in our house a lot is aha moments aha moments like they're the ones that cause us to stop like oh I heard something I had to write it down uh, if if I share something with my wife hey I, I was doing this research and you know this is so interesting to me, right? It's an aha moment because for me, I take in so much information, we all do, right? But you know, I process it all mostly internally. That's just me. That's, that's my, she processes everything externally. You know, she fills her word quota for the day and mine, right? Again, if you're watching online, Sarah, I love you. This is how we work together really well, okay? We, we just do it differently, but we have these, this, this term, this aha moment, right? And if you have an aha moment from any of this, I want to know. Whether it's as you're processing afterwards or right here in this, and this is like, this is worth pausing for, and it's an aha in your life and, and may change some of your thinking or direction, please, let's, let's discuss that. Uh, maybe a one-to-one conversation offline. It may be something that we do uh, here uh, in our sessions as well. But I, I just made a note of, of that is uh, aha moments uh, are good for me to know. I want to get the, that wisdom from you. We got to share that together. And I'm going to do the same thing from you. And a lot of what I'm sharing have come from aha moments on my journey, uh, which, is, uh, which is so fun. Um, let's go here. We're going to go to 
this slide. The generation gap. I think it's clear from our chart yesterday, from our discussion, that uh, each generation, we have different values, different ways that we've lived. They've shaped how we uh, perceive the world, what we like, what we don't like, what we think is good about our current scene, what we think is negative about our current scene, and there's differences in this room. So far, there's been no fights. Way to go. Let's, let's keep that going. Uh, some of the ways that we uh, can better interact with people outside of our own generation is just to bridge the generation gap. And there's some different tools that we can use and that I've used with some churches, I've used with the staffs that I've led, used in my own life, that will help bridge the generation gap. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today is a couple of those tools for bridging the generation gap. Everyone with me? Tracking? on this idea of bridging the generation gap. Okay, uh, the first thing is simply what we started on yesterday and that's just gaining some understanding. If all you do is just gain a little bit of understanding about a generation that's different than yours, you're already gaining some tools about how to, how to bridge that gap. You already know a little bit more about maybe the millennial generation and it just helps you relate to them a little better or helps you have a little more grace for them or maybe even go we're actually not as dissimilar as I thought and all you did was you just gained a little bit more information about them so way to go and I just like encourage you keep learning keep learning what you can about the generations that you are rubbing shoulders with which by the way is all five it's all five generations so learn what you can about them. People who are super fascinated by this stuff, we're gonna learn as much as we can, right? For others, you may just wanna pick up a little snippet here and there, but that is a great way to bridge the generation gap is to just simply learn from each other. Learn from each other, ask the questions, do some research, sit in a workshop like this or community, have some, some time together. Don't isolate yourself from the other generations. But that's a great way to bridge the generation gap. The other tool, and another, not the other, but another tool that we can use to bridge the generation gap, I call know and grow, okay? Simple, because I need things that are simple and easy to remember, just know and grow. And it starts with knowing and growing yourself first. That's the foundation. That's the cornerstone of the foundation. You gotta know and you gotta grow yourself and then you can start knowing other generations and people from other generations and then growing them, investing in them, investing in your understanding of them as well, gaining some more tools with that. But know and grow, those are two words that are easy to remember. And again, it starts foundationally with yourself. And here's what's really interesting. I found that the more that I learn about myself, the more I actually learn about other people. Anyone track with me on that? Anyone feel the same thing? The more I learn about myself, the more I realize, oh, this, this wasn't actually a problem with my brother. This was actually a problem with how I perceived him. Because what I know about myself now is when somebody says this, it's a trigger for me, right? And I go to a place that's maybe on the negative side of the, the coin, right? So the more that you end up knowing about yourself, the more you end up knowing about others as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, bridging the generation gap by knowing and growing ourselves first. The first step in knowing and growing ourselves is to know your story. Man, you guys, God has given each of you a unique journey. My journey is not like anyone else's journey in this room. It is unique. And that's not by accident. Can I get an amen on that? That's not by accident. Like we, we all have unique journeys. And you know, I'm interested in your journey. I want to learn from your journey and your story. But I also need to know my story. Because I think a lot of times uh, people go through life and they go through this journey, this unique journey that God has us on. And they don't, don't really take time to process along the way. And they don't take time to think about maybe some key markers that are on along the way. So the first part of knowing your story is to just give a really quick overview. 
Really quick overview, here are the key markers, and I would say to you, no matter your age, so if, if you're in the maturest category, you've got a lot longer on your timeline than someone who's in Gen Z, but I'd say this, even for a maturist, someone who's lived for a long time, 10 markers or less for the first part of knowing your story. What are the 10 most important things about your timeline that affect who you are today? 10 or less. If you could do it in five, you get a gold star. Like that's, that's amazing. And here's the reason why it's important for you to know your story is God's brought you on that, on that journey uniquely. And you may have something in common with someone else along your journey. It may not, not line up perfectly on a timeline, but maybe you share some things and it's a way to bridge the generation gap. The story, story doesn't, doesn't fit in one generational column. Right? Story is from the beginning, from Genesis 1 1 until today. It will be the same tomorrow. Story is an unbelievable tool. And God's given you a story. So understand that story and then become an absolute expert in sharing that story. Be like the best person ever about sharing that story. And the way that you can do that is by editing it, by figuring out what are those most important things that happened along my journey. And not even what the, what the most important things are, how do I communicate that in a way that's really most effective as I share my story with someone else? And you can't do that by just opening your mouth and starting to think through your story and then going for that. You need to actually spend some time and probably write this thing out and maybe process with someone who's really close to you and realize, well, that part of the story is maybe not as important as this part of the story. So I'm going to edit that down and out. Now, the more relationship you have, the more detail you can go in your story. But start with 10 key markers along your journey or less. Okay, or less. If you want to share love with someone, share them your story. And I actually do this with, uh, you know, with other leaders um, along, you know, along the way. Is I'll, I'll just use this as a litmus test. I'll say, hey, man, just... What's your story? What's your story? When I was interviewing people that I wanted to bring on staff, you know, after we got through a few of the, you know, the interview, you know, things were later rounds, just, man, just share your story with me, right? And it's a good litmus test for me to know whether they have led themselves well or whether maybe they're still trying to figure out themselves. I'm going to give you an example. This is my story on a timeline, right? This is just four blocks of time in my life and of just a few things in each block of time that have really shaped my journey and how I got here, okay? I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this, but early years, 83 is when I was born, so some of you were wondering yesterday, where do I fit? Well, I am a millennial, but really on the, you know, the, the, this side of that you know, equation, 1980 is kind of the beginning of that, so a lot of how I identify is with the Gen X, but at, at 83 to 99, that's the period of time I just have titled early years. Those are just early years, formative years, whatever you want to call them, early years is how I've tied it. Family legacy is a big thing in my life. I mean, a huge thing in my life because I've got this quotations, a two-sided coin of my family legacy. One side of my family, just deep, rich, spiritual roots, and I lean into that a lot, and that shapes so much of who I am. The other side of that story is an alcoholic dad, abusive, uh, you know, things in our family's past, a grandfather who uh, used his ministry to uh, have all kinds of moral failure throughout life. It is literally a two-sided coin. But man, that has shaped who I've become, what I've chosen to do or not do in life. The word legacy, I mean, it's all over on notebooks that I have. I have it on my bike. I ride a lot of bike throughout the year. And the word legacy is staring at me every time I get on the bike. Like, legacy is such a big thing because my family legacy, well, it's two-sided. One side I wish I could have kind of erased, but it's shaped who I am. And I share that story with you. Maybe some people in this room go, oh, I have kind of similar type of a thing. Now we've made a connection. And that connection doesn't matter whether we're in the same generation or a different generation, but we just bridged the gap. See how story can be an important part of this. Keep going. I accepted Christ in my early years. So some of you are like, oh, nope, I was 50 before I accepted Christ. Well, we don't have that in common. 
but I want to know about that. And now you know about that, man. I also received my calling during that, that time as well. Then the next block of time, 2000 to 2010, so 10 years right in there, I had a major life transition. Big time, for 10 years, major life transition. What I thought I was gonna do in life is not what I ended up doing in life. And this is the period of time that really uh, set that out. I moved from California to Minnesota. Whoa, everything I'd ever known in life and it just all changed. I met and married my wife, Sarah, which is amazing, incredible. I could go into more detail about that, but I also have uh, pursued my undergrad degrees. Never thought I'd go to college. And I have two undergrad degrees and Later, you'll see seminary as well. And then early ministries as well. I had different roles in ministry early in, uh, in my story. So there it is, 2000, 2010. Then we move to the next just four-year period, 2010 to 2014. It's small, short little period development. And it was intense. It was painful at times. And it was exciting at times. But I went into higher level leadership roles in ministry. And I, my heart really changed from executing the things that I had been in ministry to developing leaders. And so I enrolled in seminary and I pursued a master's degree in organizational leadership. You see how this plays into where we are today, talking about 5G leadership in a room like this in Iowa, right? 2015 to 2020, I say convergence, because that's a key word for me in leadership theory. There's a convergence theory that's within that. When 80% of who you are lines up with 80% of what you do. You are in convergence. That is like, it's your bread and butter. We all have things we don't want to do, right? I don't really want to pay bills. It's probably necessary, so I don't spend 80% of my time paying bills. It kind of fits into the 20%, you know, of things I don't want to do. I don't love cleaning the toilets. That's an important thing, so we clean the toilets. That fits into the 20%, but 80% of what I do, of how I live my life, fits into 80% of who God's truly made me to be. And so if you look at 2015 to 2020, that's when I've really been able to sit into that. It's only five years. Like, that's not, wow, convergence kids fit into that. Some of you I've talked with out on the plaza, I mean, I love being a dad. Never thought I would love being a dad. Because if you look at the early years, that two-sided coin wasn't exactly the best part of my childhood, right? I love being a dad. That is who God has made me to be. Kids rock my world in the best way possible. Anyone else have that in common with me? Love being a parent? Come on. It does not matter what generation you fit in. We just bridged the generational gap just like that. Because you know, man, I got this family legacy and this thing. I was not really excited about being a dad. And now that I'm a dad, that is who God made me to be. I absolutely love it. Senior leadership roles. I moved from, from early ministry roles to some leadership roles into some senior leadership roles. And then I launched 5th Gen Consulting, which is what I'm doing now. This is who God's made me to be in part. I don't know what it's going to look like in 2021 or the rest of this year. I don't even know what I'm going to have for lunch. What are we having for lunch, John? I don't know yet. Hey, gonna we're going to have some lunch. That's what we know. I don't know what that's going to be. But what I do know is that in this period of time, this is who God's made me to be. And it pumps me up and it gets me excited. And because of my journey, that's why I'm sitting here with you today. Now, along that, I just shared that in four minutes. Not bad, okay? 10 things in there that are really important that have shaped my journey. Now, if I'm in a different environment, I'm gonna share that maybe a little bit differently. So if I meet somebody at the supermarket, they're like, hey, well, what's your story? Why are you so nice to me? Well, I might not go into quite so many details about some of these, but I've already processed and done the work to be able to know my story. And I may pick and choose one from each era, <laughs> you right? And I may, I may start right now. I may just go, you know what? Life is really good amidst this turmoil and global pandemic and craziness that's happening all around us and this five generational society and the scene that we picture. Like, you know what? Life's good because I got kids and a family at home, which is just incredible. And I'm, I'm able to help churches and their leaders. And you know what? That just, that just makes me happy. So... I'm happy, and I hope that rubs off on you. Maybe that's all I share with them. But that doesn't happen in a way that makes a difference in their life if I don't know my story. So the foundation of growing yourself and knowing yourself is to know your story. So here it is. 
Same timeline. It's in your little handout as well. I just put four little blocks. You can put however many that you want in there. There's a title. You can title things. You don't have to title things. Significant markers. You can have one significant marker in a time period or all of them in one time period. That's okay. We're going to take four minutes right now. And I want you to write down something significant in your life and your time frame. If you don't have a pen, think through it. But just take four minutes right now. This is valuable enough for us to do that. of who you are lines up with 80% of what you do. Two more minutes. It's okay. This isn't like the end of this exercise. This is homework for you. Last minute. So your homework is gonna be, um, keep going on this. Put your 10 markers on there. I'm sure you couldn't do that in four minutes, right? Took me like four years, <laughs> right? When I start working on something like that, like tears well up in my eyes. Yeah, I'm Greek, I'm emotional, I'm passionate, that just happens. Tears of joy sometimes, tears of pain, tears of, man, I remember how I felt when I made that major life transition and decision or that decision was made for me or whatever it is. I remember you know, meeting Sarah for the first time and, and getting married, all those things, right? Like you, you just, I can't just write it down. I like sit in that. I remember how it tasted and felt and looked and smelled, all those things. They just kind of sit in that part of the story for a while. So if that's you, that's okay. This, some people will go right through this back. Oh yeah. And other people are going to take a little bit longer, but your homework is get your 10 markers or less, but those important things in your story down. And then your homework is going to be after that to start getting great, not good, get great at sharing that story.
at sharing that story. This is so important. If you want to bridge the generational gap, get great at sharing your story. Because the next piece of it, as you know and grow others, which we're not there yet, we've got to know and grow yourself a little bit more first, but as you know and grow others, as you're going to be great at sharing your story, you're also going to be a great at listening to someone else's story. Pretty soon you have relationship. You want to build great teams, you want to have great family dynamics, no matter the generation, build relationship. Relationships will, will I mean, like, true relationships with trust and love and all those things, that is a generational gap, like just dynamite. It'll explode that thing. I can sit and tell stories with my grandpa all day long. It drives my wife crazy. She's like, hey, we got to go. I'm like, well, just another hour of sharing stories. Literally. You know, she's like, the baby's crying and wants to, you know, go get fat. I'm like, Okay, I'll see, I'll see you at home. Like, I'll walk, I'll figure it out. Because I just love sharing that story with someone who has lived in a completely different generation, who shared some of his values with me and who we just don't agree on some of our values together. And that's okay, right? Share your story. Get unbelievable at sharing your story. But it starts with doing the work just like this. Okay. Next part of this, of knowing and growing yourself, is understanding that you are unique. So if your story doesn't line up with everyone else's, well, that's on purpose. And if your personality and temperaments and all those types of things don't line up with the person next to you, well, that's also on purpose. Because God made them unique, and you unique, and me unique. We shouldn't shy away from that. We can actually bridge generational gaps through this uniqueness. It doesn't silo us. It actually bridges the gap. I'm going to show you how. With Psalm 139, 14, I praise you because I'm fearfully, I'm wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. And you need to know how you are wonderfully made so well. So well. Here it is. I talked about this just briefly yesterday. This is the five-section profile that I do as I lead and coach other leaders. I've taken staff through this. I've taken uh, you know, uh, ch entire churches through this. This is such an important thing. It's the five-section profile. And each profile or each section of this uh, has an assessment that goes with it. So some of them you may be familiar with. Some of them you may not. And I'm just going to give... Probably the quickest brush stroke over this, so you may feel like you're drinking from a fire hose and you're like, I don't remember anything that he talked about with that profile or this profile. And that's okay. That's okay. We may slow the roll and come back to some of this tomorrow, but let's just give a quick overview so we have an understanding of what a profile like this looks like. You have that in your um, pages, I believe. Do you have that? Yeah, it's great. And I can email this graphic to you as well if you want this is something that I, uh, that I created uh, and that I take leaders through regularly. And this gives us such a good picture of who you are. I mean, such a good picture of who you are because each profile covers a little bit different area of who God's made you to be, right? And as we see who God's made you to be, and then we see maybe who God's made the team member that you're leading to be, and God's, you know, or we see who, who God has made your boss to be, uh, pretty soon we can start seeing some dynamics at play. And oftentimes if I take uh, a staff through this or a team through this, without even knowing anything about the team, I can pick out some dynamics that are happening. And I can just say, hey, do you guys ever have tension in this point? And you're like, okay, okay, let's, let's get into this, all right. Because this gives us such a good picture. Here it is, the spiritual gifts. This obviously, if I'm working with a, a, you know, with a secular company, this is an area that probably goes away. Depends on the type of company that we're working with. Um, but as we're working with churches and church leaders and with you, spiritual gifts is such an important thing. The foundation. If you were going to do one of these assessments, know your spiritual gifts. Please know the gifts that God has put in you when you became a follower of Christ. A uh, little side note is that um, just across the way, uh, the guys are, are given a, uh, a community on gifts, and it's going to be available on video just like this one on YouTube, on the YouTube channel.
for Okoboji Conference, probably next week, sometime after the conference is over. Go watch that, go watch that. There's also a free spiritual gifts test that, we can, that you can take. We'll get into this just a little bit more, but there's spiritual gifts. The Enneagram, how many of you are familiar with Enneagram? That's great. Awesome. This is really popular with younger generations, has gained a lot of popularity again uh, over the last probably five, seven years or so. Enneagram is huge. You go to a college campus, you have a young staff at a church, they're probably going to know what their Enneagram numbers are. Okay, so it's a, it's a personality type. Myers-Briggs, this is in the top right corner. Myers-Briggs, how we perceive the world and how we make decisions. How many are you familiar with Myers-Briggs? This is great. Awesome. Uh, Myers-Briggs is, uh, is great. I know probably the least amount about Myers-Briggs out of all of these. So I uh, have it in here because I love that perception and how we make uh, decisions that can really fill out a profile. But it's not one that uh, I'd say I'm an expert in by any means. But temperaments is a big one. The study of temperaments. Anybody familiar with that? It is gaining a ton of popularity right now. And it is out of all of these. Spiritual gifts is number one. Temperaments is number two. It's been a game changer in our house. Ooh, we're going to talk about it. I could spend the rest of the hour every day for the next month talking about temperaments. This is so good. It's how we interact with each other and communicate with each other. And like we said yesterday, if you want to bridge generational gaps, communication is key. Because communicating with somebody from a different generation, you may have to change not just the style that you com communicate with, but maybe even the medium that you communicate with. And it may not be your favorite. You may not want to send a text message because, well, it lacks the tone and, and you, can't, you can't really you know, get through what you want to or it's short and it's impersonal. But if that's what it takes to bridge a generational gap, it may be what you need to do. And vice versa. You may need, maybe you need to teach someone who texts how to maybe add some more depth into their conversations. We can do that together. The temperaments is, oh, it's awesome. It's so good. Strengths finders. Strengths finders is the last one. And this is more of your talent, your skills. And I call it your talent DNA. How many of you know your strengths? Strengths finders. Oh, I love this one. It's so, so good. Okay, I'm going to give really broad brush strokes over some of these just so that you have a little better picture. Slow me down if you need. But again, we're not going to go in too many details about any of them. We can have some offline conversations if you're really interested in one of them. Uh, or we can spend some time tomorrow if that's an interest. We'll see where we go in the next. Well, we've got 15 minutes. I, when I take a staff through this, this is a two-day workshop. And they've already done all the assessments. So they've got a lot of this info. Um, so just know you're not going to uh, really get the depth of it. This is just a broad brushstroke. This is going to help you know how God made you unique. Yeah. When you talk with your grandkids, like I do, yeah. is, that, is that approaching another generation or should it be someone outside of your own family? No, absolutely can be in your own family, should be in your family. When I say we're all leaders, some of our roles as leaders and the influence that we have is with our family unit first. So this is great. And what if you went to your grandkids and you said, you guys know your Enneagram number? Because I do. If my grandpa came and said that, my jaw would hit the floor, right? And we'd probably have a two-day conversation just about that, how he got to that point, not even his number, right? Okay, uh, here is my five-section profile. Real simple. Real simple. We just fill in what the assessment results are from each of the five sections of the profile. So my spiritual gifts, leader, pastor, teacher, those are the top three. And those are things that have been confirmed throughout the years as well. My Enneagram, I'm a three, the W means wing, three wing four. Okay, I'm a three wing four. You'll learn a little bit more about that. Myers-Briggs, INTJ, which is an architect. And if, when we get into that a little bit, you go, oh, I could probably see that. Temperaments, I'm a red primary, I'm a blue secondary. Um, we'll get more. Okay, strengths finders, strategic, number one strength, strategic. That plays a huge role into what I do now. Maximizer, take something that's great and make it better or good and make it great. That's in my strengths. Achiever, no surprise on that one to my family, for sure. I get pretty focused and driven. That way, relater, love this. Love relating to, to all of you and adaptability. Go with the flow. 
It's going to be all right. We're going to make a plan so that we can change it. Okay. Spiritual gifts. Here it is. If you want to know where you can find your list of spiritual gifts, there is where you go in Scripture. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Two places in 1 Corinthians 12. The first one is 8 through 10, and the second one is 28 through 30. Okay, that's going to give you a long list of spiritual gifts. And then Ephesians 4, starting at 11. You'll find spiritual gifts there. That will complete your list. You can also use this really great invention called the Internet. And you go to Google and you say, spiritual gifts. And it'll give you a list of them. There's a ton of them on there. You can find this graphic that's right here on that list of spiritual gifts. Okay? Uh, if you want to take a test, the one that I use uh, and, and take people through is a free one. Free is my favorite four-letter F word. Come on. This is free. Spiritualgiftstest.com. Go there. And you can take a free spiritual gifts test. It does not take long. A lot of churches have some that they've developed themselves that they really love. So if you are in a church, you haven't taken your spiritual gifts test, or maybe not in a while, talk with your pastor or your church leaders about it and say, hey, what do we, what do we use for spiritual gifts? If they don't know one, go, okay, now we use the spiritualgiftstest.com because it's free. Okay? And we're going we're to give that information out to everyone in our church. You, you should just all know your spiritual gifts. This is so important. Spiritual gifts. So there they are. Uh, that one seems pretty self-explanatory for a group like this. Less spiritual maturity. I may need to go into more detail on that, but I feel like we're probably there. Everyone nod or someone want me to slow down on this? Good. Okay. So spiritual gifts. I, I say that, but when I asked who knows your spiritual gifts, it was like, yeah, kind of, yeah, maybe know this one know this one know this one know this one so if you're only going to do one of these go to spiritualgiftstest.com and take the test it doesn't take that long and then talk with someone about it they can affirm what you put in there they can be like, i think that you probably answered that question how you want to be perceived but that's not actually who you are that's always a fun maybe a little painful conversation to have but do that do that know your spiritual gifts okay the next one is the Enneagram. And again, this one has really gained uh, a ton of popularity. I should go to this slide probably instead. This is their personality types. Enneagram is about personality types. And it's, they give you a number that's associated with each type. So how well can you see? That's not too bad. Um, so there's this little circle and all these lines that connect the different numbers and they're, they, how we relate to each other. I'm actually going through a course right now uh, about how to even like go the next level with Enneagram. And it's super interesting and exciting. And there's so much here, so much here. So I'm by no means the expert. Is, do we have an Enneagram expert in the room? Bummer. Okay, that's all right. Um, there's three triads with the Enneagram. You should know this. There's the gut triad, right? Uh, my personality is that I just go with my gut, right? That's You've heard that before. Uh, Enneagram numbers eight, nine, and one kind of fall into what they call the gut triad. Okay, the heart triad, I just I go with my heart. I lead with my heart, right? Uh, that's Enneagram numbers two, three, four. That's me. Uh, head triad, the head triad, are Enneagram numbers five, six, and seven. I put in here um, the, the course that I'm going through, which is a ton of detail, so if you're really interested, in getting a lot of this. This is a one that you've got to pay for. It's put out by Donald Miller and Ian Morgan Crone. It's called Enneagram Made Simple. It's part of his Business Made Simple series. I'd say this one's the most complex out of all of them. It's not as simple as what the title would imply. But it's, you go to storybrand.com and then you can click on the courses that you want. And this is one of them. It's new uh, for them as well. And so if you've seen any of the information that uh, Donna Miller has put out in the past about Enneagram, this is like the next level. And it's amazing. Amazing. I'm about a third of the way through because I keep going back and watching the first ones to make sure I have a good grasp on this. So I'm really growing in this myself because as I'm uh, meeting with other staff members and other churches, you know, all over the country, I mean, I'd say you're younger Church leaders, they use Enneagram. They know it. It's something that you need to know to speak their language, to bridge a generational gap. Oof, it's so, so good. Uh, perfectionist is number one. Giver is number two. You can get the, uh, the, 
the description of what each of these are. Uh, if you want to, achiever is number three. Again, that's me. Okay. Four, uh, personalist or individualist is the other one. That's my wing. Three, wing four. Uh, five is an observer. Loyalist is number six. Enthusiast, number seven. Eight is leader. We may have all a little bit of eight. We should all be able to communicate with eights, by the way. And peacemaker, nine, we need you in our lives like you don't even know. We need peace, right? So there is like the quickest brushstroke overview of Enneagram. But this is personality, right? This is a bit of personality. And you get a number because numbers are easy to remember. <clears throat> okay. Go do the Enneagram test. This free ones, by the way. There's a bunch of free Enneagram tests online. Online. This is how you're going to get to know yourself, how God's made you uniquely. And if you know yourself, you're going to be able to help know others, know and grow. Those are the two words to come back to. Okay, Myers-Briggs is the next one. Myers-Briggs is how we perceive the world and then how we make decisions. Okay, how we perceive the world and how we make decisions. Decisions. I'm at the top corner right there, INTJ, the architect, imaginative, strategic. That's come up a few times in my profile. That's maybe one that I would lean into if I saw that on someone else's. And a planner, and a planner. I'm also adaptability, so it's okay to change that plan. That's me. Uh, the personality types fall in four quadrants, which is, seems to be a theme with all these personality type things. There's four quadrants, and uh, it starts with introverts and extroverts. How many introverts do we have in the room? I love you. I'm with you. Right? How many extroverts do we have? How many of you don't know whether you're an introvert or an extrovert? Good. How many omniverts do we have? You're both. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. A lot of times this doesn't change, by the way. That's pretty, yeah. pretty common. Yeah. What you are is what you are. Uh, it's how you perceive the world. It's all kinds of things uh, affect that. So if you have a major life uh, change or event, you could change how you perceive the world or how you make decisions moving forward. So if you've taken it as a kid and then you uh, had a whole tons of life change, take it again and see, uh, see what happens. Um, okay, so introverts and extroverts, that's the first one. Sensors or intuitives. The next one is thinkers and feelers. That's common language. Like, do you, you think about it beforehand and you just feel it and go with that. And then judgers or perceivers. So those are the... Um, those are the different quadrants, how they break them down, and then you get this four-letter little thing that you can share with each other that tells about how you perceive the world and then how you go about making decisions. How you go about making decisions. You want this graphic? I'm happy to get it to you. Um, let's keep rolling. Five-section profile. The next one is temperaments. I will try not to spend the next three hours on this one. I mean, I really, you guys, I love this study of temperaments. It is so good. It's newer to me within the last two years. I took our entire staff. We ended up going through, our entire church went through this. It's Eagle Brook, which is a huge church, by the way. We did parent nights on this. We did staff retreats on this. I mean, this is so good. The study of temperaments has been around forever, like 1,000 years. Okay, the study of temperaments. Um, it has been recently repackaged in a way that I think is good for you, but there's other ways that you can go about studying this. The one that I recommend is by Kathleen Edelman. Kathleen Edelman, it says, I said this, you heard that. I said this, you heard that. This has a lot to do with communication, if you can't tell, right? Um, there's these different old words that are hard to pronounce and whatnot, sanguine, choleric, phlegmatic, and melancholic. I don't even use those. She did this great thing by putting them in colors and you just say, this is my color, right? I'm red, I'm green, I'm yellow, or I'm blue. And each one has different things. Yellow is your people person. My wife is a yellow. And I love her for that because otherwise our house would be really boring. She's a people person. People love to be around her, right? Uh, my son is red. We know this about him. He's almost five and he's red. Red is like control and power, and, and that sense of control is not a negative, right? That sense of control is so positive. He is going to be an unbelievable leader when he's older, 
But right now, he's trying to understand why it is that when I say, hey, we need to go here and change the plan, that it absolutely derails in his entire day, right? If he's playing cars and doing exactly what I want him to do by having some quiet time or some alone time, and he's doing what, and I come up and say, hey, bud, it's lunchtime. It is a meltdown because he has this control of the environment he has. But if I walk in and go, hey, bud, in about five minutes or so, we're going to have some lunch, right? I walk back in there in five minutes or so, or in a minute, honestly, because he doesn't have a sense of time like we do. I just say, hey, bud, time for lunch. It's a totally different story. Knowing this about Finley helps me be a better dad to him. Now think about this if it expands beyond just our family unit. Think about if I know how my team communicates well whether they're people persons or whether, you know, whether they process internally or externally. This is such good information. Kathleen Edelman, she's on staff with North Point Church, right? Uh, Andy Stanley, not if you're familiar with this, okay? Uh, Kathleen is unbelievable, took this to their staff first, uh, packaged it in a way that it makes a huge difference for their church, and then sent it out basically in this type of a package. Now, you can just buy this on Amazon or at the North Point website. I said this, you heard that. The book is like maybe yay thick and it's got all these great graphics and, and, and different things uh, in it. There's an app, there's an app that you would put on your phone or you can watch the videos online. And there's a, there's a video where Kathleen sits with four people, one from each temperament, and they just kind of do some little case studies and some discussion. Uh, and it goes along with the, with a session that you do in the workbook. Super interesting, amazing. Uh, and then there's all kinds of information that happens uh, after, after that. There's, there's uh, yeah, it just goes on and on. So this is worth doing. I'm telling you, you should know your temperament. And if you know the temperaments of the people around you, you will be a better leader. You will be a better leader. It's not that expensive. I think it's like 35 bucks. My wife and I shared a workbook until we realized, oh, I take a ton of notes and so does she. This isn't gonna work. I bought her own workbook, right? Uh, Kathleen Edelman, we had her uh, at Eagle Brook. I got to spend a bunch of time with her. She is uh, amazing. She's also available. So if you were like, hey, I don't actually, after doing all the assessment, I don't know what color I am. That was actually me, right? I didn't actually know what color I was. It was not making sense. It was, uh, had some conflicting things in there. She goes, well, it's because when you read this question, you probably had a uh, tension between these two. So you pick something else and it ended up telling you that it ended up telling me I was green. I was green and red and that doesn't work. That's like a stoplight and a, and a green light together. You, you can't do that. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. So we sat down sat down on our campus and just said, well, who am I really? What is my color really? And she ended up saying, hey, you're purple. You're purple. You're the, like one number difference between your blue and your red. Here's what it means for you and how you can interact with other people and how you appreciate being communicated to. A application of that comes from my involvement in the marketplace. Yeah. You might find this interesting. I'm doing a uh, two-day workshop with a board directors in an organization. And so we went through quite a bit of this. We used to be ISC just yep. very similar. Right. We're about halfway through and I had them sitting in a U shape. And most of these people knew each other, of course. The one board director member looked across the room at his cohort and he said, Now I know why you're such a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that opened up a completely different thought process. Yeah. Not really how this is so valuable. Yep. Yep. By the way, if you're a red and someone says, now I know why you're a jerk, you go, finally. It's not, it's not something where you're like, forget you. you no, know, no, no. You go, oh, finally. You get me a little bit, right? I got a fair bit of red in me, right? Okay. It's so interesting. So such an important uh, thing for us. The more you know about your temperament, the better it is. If you were going to do two of these, start with spiritual gifts and then do the temperaments. I believe in it. I really do.
We're going to round out this five section profile with the strengths finders. We had quite a few of you who uh, were familiar with strengths finders. This is strengths finders 2.0, the one that uh, you know, we've taken so many staff members through. This is part of the interview process when I was at Eagle Brook, by the way. Um, it's so beneficial to know someone's strengths. This is like your talent DNA, right? Your talent DNA. Uh, and there's four quadrants. Again, a theme, influencing, executing, strategic thinking, and relationship building. And there's different strengths that fit within each of those. And you can learn a lot about how someone works, how teams work together. I took our staff through this two consecutive staff retreats in a, in, uh, in a row, so two years in a row. Um, uh, about where do we fit? How do we fit together? We realized, man, we had a whole lot of relationship building and a whole lot of executing on our team. We didn't have a whole lot of influencing. And so it's like, well, no wonder why we're having problems recruiting volunteers, right? Well, we execute the trainings really well, but nobody shows up <laughs> because we haven't really influence them very well. Well, now we know as we're looking for another team member, Maybe it'd be a good thing if they had at least one influencing strength, right? I have a, one strength in each of these quadrants and two in relationship building, right? I, I love people. They wear me out. I'm an introvert. We know that from my five-section profile. I'm an introvert. I love people. I'm in an extrovert's job, but I'm an introvert. So I know things about myself that I got to balance out. When I, when I talked yesterday about the value of work-life balance, it's because I know myself better now. I know that I'm an achiever and I would just spend all my time and all my effort and energy into the things that I'm passionate about and things that I'm working on. And then when I go to actually execute some of those things and lead my team, I'm gonna be so depleted because I've been around people too much and investing in other people so much that I'm not gonna be at my best. And by the way, as a leader, if you're not at your best, your team's not at your best, right? So I know this about myself. So work-life balance is something that's so important to me because of who I am, who God's created to me, me to be. And your profile, if it looks different than my profile, it doesn't mean that your profile's any better or any worse than mine. What it means is that we should know each other's profile, who God's made you to be and who God's made you to be and how we can maybe use our gifts and our strengths to all work together as one body to glorify God, to love others. You want to bridge generational gaps? Know someone and know yourself. And then you can grow yourself and then you can invest in growing them. And we talk about five generations all working together. This works at home, your home units, your families. This works in the marketplace. And by God, I can tell you, this works in church. I know from experience. We want to know how to grow a church and grow younger. Well, let's start here. Let's start by knowing ourselves, especially if you're a church leader. I mean, this is so important. God has put you in that role for a specific reason. Let's know who you are. I mean, really know who you are. And then let's build our vision for the church based on the gifts and talents and passions that God's put in you. And that's how you're going to reach the people who God wants you to reach. And the church down the road that does something a little bit different because they have a different leader, well, they're going to do the same thing and then they're going to be able to reach a different demographic of people. And the multiplication just continues to go. Know yourself and grow yourself. Now this five section profile, man, there's so much. Like I said, I take teams through this in two days. I don't know, a workshop, but they've already done all the assessments, and sometimes we've had some Zoom calls or whatever beforehand. Uh, they've done the work already. So this is, again, drinking from a fire hose. If you're like, he said Enneagram, and I'm still trying to figure out how to spell that thing. That's okay. That's good. That's fine. Um, you've got the basic idea of what some of these are that's in the handout as well. You can do some research. I love talking about this stuff, so... Let's talk about it. I really, truly believe you want to bridge generational gaps in your family, in your community, in the places that you work, and in our churches. Know yourself and grow yourself first as a foundational element, and then get to know and then grow the people who are around you. So if you know a little bit about someone, just a little bit, some of their markers along their timeline, 
you're going to be so much better at leading them into the future because you know a bit about their past. Whew. All right, all right. Couple minutes here. Thoughts, questions, concerns? In the back. Edelman, Kathleen Edelman. Yep. Yep. And she and her team are great. I'm telling you, they are great. It's from Gallup. And so you can just go to StrengthsFinders 2.0. Again, they sell it on Amazon. They may even sell it here. I mean, it's pretty common. The book, by the way, is like, it's really small and thin. I think I've got a dozen copies. Like, I mean, it's like, this is a book. This is one that you get easy to go through. Yeah, the assessment takes a little while. It's like 100 plus questions. Yeah. I just got a question that came to me just now about do you think a pastor builds the church? Or do you think it's the lay people that build the church? I think God builds the church. <laughs> there's, your, there's your church leader answer for you. It depends. I really do think it depends. Depends on the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pastor is really important. I'd say critical. Yeah. God's put that leader in place for a reason. Yeah. That's, that's a good and, and given him a journey or her a journey that is unique for a reason and put things inside that person that's unique for a reason, given them the spiritual gifts of pastoring and teaching for a reason. I, have, I see church boards all the time who are like, that's good, but we're going we're gonna to run the thing, and then they'll execute some, some of the deal, and they squash who God's made them to be. you gotta, you got to work together in all that. So it really does. It, it depends. It depends, but the pastor's so important in that. Yeah, absolutely. With a good support system. Who else? Two more? Oh, two of them from the same row? Maybe three more. <laughs> So I've been thinking about that a lot recently because Paul did call himself a master builder. Yeah. And God really is the ultimate builder. Jesus said, I will build my church. And if I'm doing that, the gates of hell will not stand against it. If the master or person, someone is doing it, the gates of hell really could penetrate quite easily. Mm -hmm. Their work. But I do believe all of us are the construction crew because mm -hmm. we're called to encourage one another and build each other up. And we should see that as building up the temple, the living stones together. Yeah. So I think it's both and plus more. Listen, the pastor's not the church. Everyone knows that. The pastor's not the church. The pastor is entrusted with and given the responsibility of shepherding the church and guiding it, casting the vision and making sure that we're healthy and safe and that we grow and have what we, like, yeah. Yeah. Many people can fit the boxes, but then there's, I've been called into roles that I would say aren't my strength. Yeah. But as a mom, I'll sit there and go, that's not a strength of mine. Yeah. I have to parent through this. Or being a wife, or being in a church where I work, or married to a pastor, and to look at Moses who said, I'm not good at speaking. And yet God said, okay, I'm going to put you there, I'm going to make you speak, and I'm going to bring people around you who will help you speak. But he definitely wouldn't have fit into Yeah. That's a great goal, but I don't know, with God working through our weaknesses, I don't think it's a goal that all will be achieved. Or do you go already have the spirit of God living in you? Yeah, mm. of course there are those weaknesses. Um, so the test get a little confusing for me. Yep. I'm not sure how it plays into a Christian worldview sometimes. Sure. I know it works within a community for me to know my children better, and that's great. Yep. It's a tool, but I don't want an ultimate tool, because I'm always pushed into roles that I wouldn't put in my spirit category. Sure. And I don't think that's a bad thing by any means, but I do think you should know that you are stepping into a role and ah, if it, is, if it fits outside of who, uh, man, God's really even made me to be up to this point. So maybe it's a forming time in your life. Maybe it's the time where God's going to say, okay, this is who you were in this part of your journey. But man, next season, you, know, you fill out this five section profile again, it's going to look pretty different because I'm doing something in your life, right?
I think it's. Okay, now I'm being called to do this. Now I'm being called to do this, so I'm going to put myself in that. I think it depends on the person. Are you just not good at saying no? Do you just, do you care enough that you're going to fill any role that needs to be filled? Well, that's not, that's not a weakness. That's a strength. We need people like you because I'm not going to do that. I have no problem saying no. It's gotten me into all kinds of trouble and it's saved me from so many things. But I also would not have been able to continue at times without people who said, yeah, yeah I'll do that. I'm, I may not be able to do it the best way ever, but I'm your person. Yeah, let's go for it. So we need you too. So no, I don't necessarily know. That's a probably bigger, bigger picture question. Yeah. As, as a teacher for 30 years, what I found uh, most beneficial was to know my students. Yeah. But for them to know each other, we did a couple of different tests at the beginning of the year, the first day of school. And so then we would get them in groups and show which one had their strengths. So I always said, so who in this room do you think will be the millionaire at your 10th year reunion? Will it be the A students or will it be the C student? And we talked about how success comes different, but to know others mm -hmm. is the real gift. Yeah, so important. We had one more. We didn't have one more. That's great. Yeah. Sharon, Sharon, I can kind of echo that to a degree. I've served internationally, and I have colleagues around the world in the ministry, and essentially we're having the North American conversation that much of the rest of the church does not have. Agreed. Because necessity means you do what needs to be done if you're part of a church. Um, so we should consider this whole thing a luxury. Mm -hmm. It is a great thing to strive towards giving our best gifts to the church, the work of God, but not at the expense of things that need to be done. There's some beautiful things that happen in that 20%, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, just like the graph that we showed of the different generations and what, what some of the markers are and some of the, uh, the key products that, have, you know, that mark that generation, this is all a, a, a U.S. equation. If you look at one that's even just like from the U.K. or other developed parts of the world, it looks vastly different. It really does. Absolutely. And so, yeah, a lot of this is, you're right, is a uh, conversation for this to be relevant, you know, if we cross borders, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the other values of all of this that we're discussing, and maybe a little bit to share and stuff, not just, I find myself, my personality style, it's in, in the four areas that you've been talking about, they use a little different descriptors. And I'm a combination uh, eagle, driver, peacock, seeking recognition. I found myself in a role where I needed to be an owl, cross T's, dot eyes. I don't do that. Mm. But once I understood this, I, I realized this is how I need to think. Mm -hmm. Reorient my thinking, because I'll never get this done by the Never really help me understand what I needed to be able to do. Yeah. Very contrary to my norms. Yeah. 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 Regardless of all of those, whether you're in that role or you're not in that role or you don't know, understanding, the understanding of the different generations or the understanding of who you are, understanding of how you tick, Maybe what makes you go red, right? Or how you idle. My idol is so much higher than other people's idol at times. And I could just run a team over because I'm thinking, hey, we're doing fine. We can idle like this for all day. And they're sitting here going, I can barely breathe. Right? And I'm in like the best place. And they're in overdrive. I got to know that about my team. I will lead them better if I know that about myself and if I know that about my team. So even if they're saying yes to things and maybe in a role they, you know, isn't doesn't fit in line with convergence theory, if you will, right? Or they're they're doing something where they think, whew, this is a little bit different than what my strengths are, right? The knowing it is the first part. Important. 
Now, I appreciate you guys. I really do. This has been fun for me. Super fun. I hope you're enjoying this as well. Let's have a continued conversation, Plaza. And afterwards, email me if you need, Travis at consulting.org. I can get you any of these documents or talk with you about your churches, organizations, and go from there. Way to go, guys. See you tomorrow.